Good afternoon and welcome to the Assembly of Yah here at Marseilles, Illinois. Again, we haven't been with you and since the feast uh, out at Estes Park, Colorado, back in October. We pray that Yahweh is blessing you, with you, uh, giving you more wisdom, revelation, lifting you up, guiding you in His path. We thank you for being with us again. It's just about winter time. We had five inches of snow this week. It's the 27th now of November 2004. We have a very interesting message today. We also have a new visitor from uh, Rockford, about an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes from us, uh, Jeff. And uh, we just appreciate what Yahweh is doing for us here. We, uh, we pray that you're getting ready for the winter time, that uh, you are starting more studies. A lot of times in the winter time that we get deeper into the Word because we're kind of shut in. And what we're doing now, we're studying more prophecy, more Jubilee, the studies on Jubilee's days and the land Sabbaths, and we've gotten quite a bit into heavy prophecy. We thank you for being with us. At this time, as we always do, we turn the session and our worship over to Beverly for song and praise. Hallelujah. Turn in your song books. The first song we're going to sing is on number 93. It's called, We Bring a Sacrifice of Praise. We're going to go through that twice. Turn to number 19. Bless Yahweh.
I will bless Yahweh. by this song, the first part the men sing, the second part the women.
Thank you, Beverly. It's always good to praise Yahweh, and Yahweh inhabits the praise of his people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I just want to encourage more praise out there for Yahweh. I know that there's days that uh, sometimes are dark and dreary. Sometimes we feel that way in our soul. And the best way to get rid of that is to sit down and just start singing softly unto Yahweh and let that praise, let his spirit, let that, that love just well up in, inside of you. That will always, always lift us up, lift our head, because he's the lifter of our countenance. We have our Torah reading now. It's from the classic Torah that we use from Hebrew roots. I'd ask you to go to Hosea, Hosea chapter 11. We're going to read from Hosea chapter 11, 7, verse 7 to 12, 12. 11, 7 to 12, 12. And we're not going to make comment on this. This is the classic Torah reading for the weekend, for the Sabbath day, Shabbat. But it's a great lead-in to the message that we have. And so there's a parallel here where I would ask you to try and make that connection. Verse 7. Yahweh says, and my people are bent to backsliding from me, though they called them, though they, that would be the prophets, called them to the Most High, none at all would exalt him. How shall I give thee up, Ephraim? How shall I deliver thee, Israel? How shall I make thee as Adma? How still, how shall I set thee as Zeboim? My heart is turned within me. My re repentings are kindled together. I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. I will not turn to destroy Ephraim, for I am Yahweh and not man, the Kodesh one in the midst of thee. I will not enter into the city. They shall walk after Yahweh. He shall roar like a lion. When he shall roar, then the children shall tremble from the west. They shall tremble as a bird out of Egypt and as a dove out of the land of Assyria. And I will place them in their houses, saith Yahweh. Ephraim compassed me with their lies, and the house of Israel with deceit. But Judah yet ruleth with Yahweh, and is faithful with the saints. Ephraim feedeth on wind, and followeth after the east wind. He daily increases lies and desolation, and they do make a covenant with the Assyrians, and oil is carried into Egypt. Yahweh hath also controversy with Judah, and will punish Judah, uh, Jacob, according to his ways, according to his doings, will he recompense him. He took his brother by the heel in the womb, and by his strength he had power with Yahweh. Yea, he had power over the angel, and prevaileth. He wept and made supplication unto him. He found him in Bethel, and there he spake with us. Even the Yahweh, Elohim of hosts, the Almighty is, uh, Yahweh is his memorial. Therefore turn thou to thy Elohim, keep mercy and judgment, and wait on thy Elohim continually. He is a merchant, the balances of deceit are in his hand. He loveth to oppress, that's Ephraim. Ephraim said, Yet I am become rich. I have found me out substance. In all my labors they shall find none iniquity in me that were sin. And I that and I that am Yahweh thy Elohim from the land of Egypt will yet make thee to dwell in tabernacles as in the days of the solemn feast. I have also spoken by my prophets and have multiplied visions and use similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. Is there iniquity in Gilead? Surely they are vanity, the sacrifices of bullocks in Gil Gilgal. Yea, their altars are as heaps in the furrows of the fields. And Jacob fled into the country of Syria, and Israel, ser and ser and Israel served for a wife, and for a wife he kept sheep. And by a prophet Yahweh brought Israel out of Egypt, and by a prophet was he preserved. Ephraim provoked him to anger most bitterly. Therefore shall he leave his blood upon him, and his reproach shall Yahweh return unto him. That concludes our reading. 
At this time, as we always do, we take time to make our prayers and requests known before Yahweh. We encourage you to do that. There are many situations that we find ourselves in that we seem helpless, we seem confused, we seem powerless to help in family situations, the assembly, and many things that come before us. Many of these things are trials, many of the, some of these things are temptations and afflictions and oppressions from the enemy. But the strongest thing that we can do is pray. And we'll be back with you shortly. Praise Yahweh. I just want to give a testimony of the wonderful prayer time that we had with Jeff, our, our new friend from uh, Northern Illinois. And our prayer time lasted a lot longer than it normally does. And Yahweh really touched us. Seek Yahweh with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your understanding. He says, I stand at the door and I knock. That isn't just for unbelievers. That isn't just for people who are in trouble. It's everyone who seeks him. And we, as believers, as called out ones, Ecclesia, need to seek him with all of our hearts and not take for granted that we have arrived that we not sleep in the night as those who have no understanding, as the wicked sleep in the night. The time now is high time. Our salvation is closer than we think. The title of this message today is Time to Awake. Time to Awake. And I believe that Yahweh is talking to people who are already called, people who are already in the assembly. That's who he's talking to. Let's go to Habakkuk 2. Habakkuk chapter 2, 1 through 4. Habakkuk is, is asking questions of Yahweh. He's saying, why does Yahweh allow wicked, the wicked practices to go on in Israel? Why does he allow that among our people? He says, why will Yah use the wicked to punish Israel? Isn't there some other way to do this? Why exalt the wicked over Israel? The, the, the ones, the family, the, the names, the tribes that he has called out unto himself. Why does he, why are you going to do this? And he asks the question, what is, a, what is about to happen? What will you do, O Yahweh? And here's what Yahweh says. And this is what Habakkuk is saying to Yahweh as Yahweh listens to the supplication. Habakkuk says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower, and will watch to see what he will say unto me, and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And Yahweh answered me and said, Write the vision, and make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak, and not lie, though it tarry. Wait for it because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is, is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. Habakkuk is saying here that he's standing watch, that he knows Yahweh is about to do something. He knows that Yahweh's hand is not slack. He knows that he doesn't slumber or sleep. And there is a vision. And without a vision, the people perish. But this vision is a vision of something else. It's an appointed time. And he says, it will not tarry. Yahshua said 2,000 years ago. Yahshua said 2,000 years ago, I come quickly. And we are right there at the very precipice, very edge of his return, of Jacob's trouble, of the things that are going to come upon the earth. And Yeshua says in his scriptures, he says, when I return, will I find faith? He says that because things are in question. People are questioning their faith. They're questioning their understanding. They're questioning the leadership and the ministry. They're questioning the scriptures. They say he delays his coming. All things will continue as they are. Nothing will change. It will all continue. Believers are saying that today. People in the assembly are saying that. People should, who should know better by Yahweh's spirit and discernment and by the scriptures. He says he will not tarry. 
Our lifetime is 70 years, three score and 10. And we say, well, if it doesn't happen in our lifetime, it isn't going to happen at all. And it is a point of time. It will come. It will come. The answer to what Habakkuk is saying is what Yahweh is about to do is this. I will stand on the wall and I will watch and will say unto and see what he says unto me. Because I know he's going to answer. That's what's going on here. How many are watching today? How many are awake? How many are fervent? How many are zealous? How many are seeking Yahweh with all his heart? How many are watching Jerusalem, the cup of trembling? Oh, we hear in many assemblies, pray for Jerusalem. Peace in Jerusalem. And we know there won't be any peace until Yahshua comes back and he's right at the door. It's an appointed time. Let's go to Romans 13, 11. Paul's talking to the assembly at Rome, and he says, And that, knowing the time, and now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than we believed. Yeshua said the time is short 2,000 years ago. Paul said 2,000 years ago. It's closer than we think, and it's at the very door. But we say in our hearts, well, it hasn't happened for 2,000 years. And, and even Yehuda says that it's only about the year 5,000 850 something something like that if we counted on that calendar we would have another 150 years to go we can see by the signs the iniquity the trespasses the blasphemy the witchcraft that is growing today that the destruction will be soon all the signs are there and yet people say in the assembly well it may be 50 or 80 or 90 or 100 years from now but you know even if it would be that long away, which we don't believe at all. And I'll tell you a few things about that later. He says, our time is always at hand. In the past seven years, Beverly and I have been together for ten years, in the last seven or eight years, we know almost 20 believers who have died, either by natural deaths or by accidents. He says, your time is always at hand. We may not see the tribulation, we may not see days of trouble, Jacob's trouble, but we may see an evil day in our life. We may come to our short end, that we build not, not tear down our barns and build bigger barns, and because we have so much increase, because tonight or tomorrow morning we may have to make an account. The time is short for every one of us. Are we sleeping? Are we resting? Are we coasting in this marvelous called out into the family of Yahweh, out of darkness into mar marvelous light, that we may show forth his praises? Are we coasting in this? Not one of us is worthy of the calling that we've been called to. He has had mercy. While we were yet at enmity with him, Yahweh sent his son to die for us. None of us are worthy of his calling, but he has had mercy, he has a grace on us, as the song says. And in the greatness of this calling that is, the ear is not heard, the eye is not seen, the greatness of all this, are we coasting, are we sleeping in the night as the wicked do? The thief is at the door. Let's go to Matthew 24. The thief is at the door. What did Yahshua say about the thief? What did he say about the adversary? Matthew 24, 42. 24, 42. He said there, and I believe it's in red letters there in your King James, if you're using that. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour the master doth come. But know this, that if the goodman of the house had known in what watch or what hour the thief would have come, he would have watched and would have not suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ready. Be ye also ready, for in such an hour, as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. If we are ready, if we are watching, he comes with reward, doesn't he? Who then is faithful and a wise servant, 
whom the, his master hath made him ruler over all his house household, to give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant. And we are called servants. He's talking to the people who already are called out to Yahweh. Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he cometh, shall find him doing or doing so. If we are watching, and I'm going to give you a list of things that he gave me this morning, of things that we should be doing, some guidelines. If we're doing what we're supposed to be doing and we're watching, for example, watching our skirts to keep our skirts from being stained, torn, he will come with reward and he will embrace us when we meet him in the sky in that first resurrection and he will say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, but not if we're sleeping. He says, behold, I come quickly. But he says, the wicked sleep as they sleep in the night, and they will not know. Paul says, in Thess to Thessalonica, he says that the wise shall understand. Daniel says that too, and that it will come upon them as a thief in the night, those who sleep in the night. But it won't be that way with us. And we hear people in the assembly say, oh, when is this going to happen? Oh my gosh, what are we going to do? Can, are we going to flee to Petra? Are we going to go to the mountains? Where are we going to hide from all this trouble and everything? And they have this attitude of doubt, unbelief, unsuredness, and an underlying feeling of wanting to save themselves, to save the flesh. When Yahshua said expressly, he that seeks to save his life shall lose it. Where is the wisdom being taught today? Where is the wisdom in the assemblies? How many of us are maybe sleeping? I'm not condemning anyone today. Yahweh is just saying to us today, take stock of ourselves. Evaluate ourselves. Listen to him. What is going on in our life? He says in many, many uh, scriptures, put on zeal as a garment. And vengeance is a cloak. Get zealous. Paul said it's good to be affected zealously. Yahweh would have us affected, wide awake, alive, zealous, excited for him and his word and his work, even if we were going in a wrong direction like Shaul. As we saw in that example, we always a very able to straighten us out and put us on the right path, whether we're going to Damascus or not. Hallelujah. What are the characteristics? What are the characteristics of some that sleep in the assembly? What, what, how can we tell when we meet people whether they're sleeping or not? I've talked to many people in assemblies, and sometimes you share a truth, and you give them scriptures to support the truth and such, and it may even be a, a relatively common middle-of-the-road core teaching. And they'll say, well, you know, maybe I haven't heard of that or I didn't understand it that way before. And they go on with the same conversation, not even broaching that, never getting into that, that, that statement, that, that teaching, as if nothing happened. They just go right on past it and their eyes kind of glazed over, like, kind of like they're asleep, but their eyes are, their eyes are open. Have you heard the, ever hear the expression, the light is on but there's nobody home? It's kind of like that. Are some of us asleep? Here are some characteristics. I've got about seven or eight characteristics of maybe some things that might be associated with being spiritually asleep. Unaware of what is happening around them or what is happening in the assembly. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 11, 28. Do you know what Yahweh is returning there? Do you know what Yahweh is doing in your life? Do you know what areas he's working in, what he wants to correct in the path that he's put you on? Because we should know. The challenge should be to do it. The challenge should be to do it with a right heart and with zeal. Not going from pillar to post trying to find out with confusion what Yahweh is doing. Yahweh's not an ella confusion. Confusion is of the enemy. You see that fingerprint? There's four fingerprints of Satan. I've told you that many times. You see that fingerprint and you know that the enemy is working in your life. Confusion. 1 Corinthians 11, 28 through 31. Paul says to Corinth, 
says, let a man examine himself. Now, normally we read this before the Feast of Passover, before we go to the table. It says, let a man examine himself, so let him eat of that bread. That means of Yahshua, and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh to his own damnation or condemnation, not discerning the master's body. For this cause, here we go, for this cause many are weak, they are sickly, and they sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. If we judge ourselves every day, we have the understanding. If we walk, if we repent, if we go along in the direction he wants, then when he comes in the air, that will be a time of joy, of reward, of recompense, of goodness, of fulfillment. We will put off this old shackle, this old body, this old tabernacle. I know that normally we read this traditionally before Passover, but aren't we supposed to examine ourselves every day? Aren't we supposed to examine the direction we're going, our heart's attitude, the spirit that's, that's going on within us, the spirits that have discernment, the spirits that are talking to us? This is a proactive calling. We have to be mobile. We have to be zealous. We have to be awake. We have to be actively involved in what Yahweh is doing with us and those around us because we're called not only to believe and have faith, we're saved by faith, keeping his Torah, his covenant, commandments, statutes, judgments, showing love for him first, Yahweh first, and then the brethren. But we need to also understand what's going on around us. Right now, some of you know, because about 120 letters were sent out two weeks ago, that YNCA is going through a hostile takeover. There are four elders there that, not through a leading of Yahweh, we don't believe, are trying to, with hostility, anger, aggression, covetousness, carnalness, going to world courts in law to steal the assembly away from the normal leadership that is there. We saw some of this coming two years ago. But it didn't seem like the assembly knew this was coming. Within their own midst, within their own family. We, when we heard about this report, we weren't surprised in the least. Because we knew the people that were there and what they were doing. If we would have told the leadership, I, I'm not sure they would have believed us. Maybe we were wrong not to say something. We need to be aware of what is going on around us, not just the assembly, our families, with our children, our spouses, and not be in a cloud, not be in a daze. Point number two, many are unresponsive to the leading and the situations that Yahweh is giving us as teaching, as revelation, as knowledge, as learning situations. We've talked about this many times. That every time we go into a situation that is new, whether it's a, an attack, an oppression, whether it's something uplifting, something good, we meet someone that is different in our lives, we have to ask ourselves, what is Yahweh doing? What am I supposed to learn out of this situation? We're in a training program. We're in training program for first fruits as priests and kings for his kingdom. We all know that. I, we've, all of you know that out there on the, on the outreach program. But some are not responsive to those situations. They just try to get through them the best they can, unscathed or unhurt or unharmed with minimum damage. Let's go to Matthew 26.40. Matthew 26.40. He came unto his disciples, and he found them asleep, and they said unto him, Peter, what? Could you not watch for me for one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter into not temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Yahshua, in the night in which he was betrayed, went off three times after he left Peter, James, and John. And he asked them to watch, and he went off a little ways to pray. And it was late, they were tired, they probably spent the whole day in preparation for the Passover that night, which they had just come from. And they were sleepy, they weren't just tired, they were sleepy. Sleepy will kill you. 
You can, you can be sitting in a chair if you're very, very tired, not tired but sleepy in the afternoon with the sun on you after having a meal. And before you even know it, you, you've closed your eyes and you're off to sleep. You didn't even know you passed. You almost pass out. Sleepy is what's dangerous, not being tired. And they fell asleep. He came back, I believe, three times. And they were asleep. And he said, what? What? You, you, you couldn't? You don't, you don't understand what I'm about to face. I'm pleading with my father for my life and, the, and this cup that I'm about to drink. drink. Uh, th this is uh, the crisis of my life in ministry. And you couldn't even watch an hour. They slept. You know, we could talk about the ten virgins. They were, they were called. They were in the faith. They were, they were virgins, not defiled by women, by pagan beliefs, by pagan practices. And yet, when there was a shriek about midnight, at that time, they were all asleep. Fortunately, with Yahweh's grace, five of them were wise. Five of them were wise. And that's the thing that saved them. If they hadn't been wise, they wouldn't even have made it in the door. They were all asleep. Are we unresponsive to the leading and the situations that are around us? Are we praying about situations around us? Asking for discernment, wisdom, understanding, Yahweh's leading to do right in the situation, to learn, to exercise good judgment in Yahweh's will in our lives? Or are we just trying to get through those situations? Sometimes even forgetting to pray. Let's go to the next point. Many of us are very passive about our walk. Yahweh doesn't want us to be lukewarm. We know what he said in Revelations about being lukewarm to the Laodicean assembly. He said, I, I would have you hot or cold. I would... Have you motivated somehow, some direction, at least I could do something with you. But when you're lukewarm, I just want to spew you out of my mouth. I can't do anything with you. Many of, of us are passive about our walk. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians 3.9. 2 Thessalonians 3.9-14. Paul's talking to Thessalonica again. He says, not because we have, have not power, not because we have not power to make ourselves, and, but we don't, he's talking about why he didn't take money from them. He didn't take food from them. He said he worked with his own hands, right? So he'd be an example. That's what the foretext here, this, uh, the text is talking about. Paul wasn't passive. Paul was zealous. He says, you know, we didn't take these sort of things from you because we don't have power, authority, ability to do so. We do have, he says. But to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you. Now, here's an apostle commanding an assembly. Read the word. He is commanding them. It isn't a suggestion. This is not a democracy. The apostle has authority over an assembly. Even though today we don't have very many, if any, apostles. He gives them a command. And he says, look, if and no man will work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly. And he's calling this attitude of being passive, not working, kind of coasting along, kind of depending on others. He calls it walking disorderly. Walking not at all, or working not at all, but our busybodies. Now them that are such, we command, here's the word again, and exhort, teach you, instruct you, by our Master Yeshua Messiah, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. See, when we're passive, when we're asleep, we're not involved with well-doing. The hands are hanging down, the eyelids are closed, we're passive. If any man obey not our words by this epistle, 
Note that man and have no company with him. Break fellowship with him, that he might be ashamed. Now Paul goes on to say, don't count him an enemy. You don't have to fellowship him. But don't have any extra undue company with him. And make it clear, of course, why you're doing so. Now that's pretty serious, is, is to break partial fellowship. That's pretty serious to do that with a believer, isn't it? That's how strong Paul thought about this. The next point. Many of us are blind, sleeping with our eyes closed. Actually blind. You know, when you sleep, this is a metaphor, when you sleep at night, you're not aware of what's going around around you. You're not thinking about yourself. You're not thinking and aware of what's going on around you. You don't see anything. You can't hear anything. You're oblivious. You're totally oblivious and vulnerable when you sleep. Vulnerable. Many of us are blind, sleeping with our eyes closed. Let's go to Matthew 15, 14. Matthew 15, 14. Yeshua said about the leaders of the day, we're talking about the Pharisees and Sadducees before the temple was destroyed about 30, 29 or 30 A.D. He says, let them alone. Let the blind leaders of the blind, they be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, he's talking about those who are passive, letting others do their work for them, lead them, do their religion, do their faith, do their worship for them, that they're both blind and they will both fall into the ditch. If we walk in this walk with our eyes partially closed, with our discernment, our spiritual understanding, our hearts and minds dulled, dull of hearing, Paul said in other scriptures, we're going to fall into the ditch. And you know what that is? That is a prelude to what it says in Thessalonians, unless there is a falling away, the man of sin will not be revealed. That's a prelude to leaving the assembly, to leaving the faith, and leaving the one of Israel, the Kodesh one of Israel. It's dangerous walking down a highway with all kinds of moving obstructions and cars and animals and carts and things with our eyes half closed. That's how busy this life is today with all the voices, with all the magazines, all the teachings, and all, all the deception, and all the noise that is around us in this Baal society, that's what's going on. We're walking down a highway, a path, that is full of danger. And if we negotiate that situation in this walk with our eyes half closed, we're going to get hurt, and that accident may be fatal. Some of us want others to do our religion for us, to do our faith and our worship and our praying and our reading for us. How much time do we spend, spend in, the, in the Word, Yahweh's Word, every day? Now, it says that man does not live on bread alone. It suggests, it doesn't suggest, it tells us that there is spiritual food that is necessary for the spirit and the body. The word of Yahweh is sharp and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. The word is spirit. The word is truth. Yahshua is the word and the spokesman. And he manifests himself in Yahweh through the word, through his spirit. We need that to sustain us. How much time are we spending every day in the word? How much time every day are we spending in prayer? How much time are we spending in intercession? How much time every day are we spending in fellowship? Maybe talking with someone on the phone or encouraging someone, maybe handing out tracts, doing some of the work. What do we put first in the morning? What do you put first in the morning? Does Yahweh come in at noon? Does he come in at 3 o'clock in the time of the afternoon offering? Does he come at 7 o'clock at night after the sun has already set, it's already the next day? When does Yahweh come into your life? When do you let him in? When do you seek him first in your lives? David said, I will seek you early in the morning with my whole heart. 
Next point. Some will not exercise their gifts, their talents, their abilities. Let's go to Matthew 25. Matthew 25, 24. Verse 24. All of us, you know, we, we hear many prayers in the assembly. Yo, Yahweh, show us my talent. Show us my ability. Give me a talent. Give me all the gifts that are in chapter 12 and 13. But do we really seek those talents? And, and if we find that we might have an opportunity to learn the guitar or the auto harp or, or do readings of the Torah, you very well have a good voice and good speaking manner. If you have some, some gift or something, do, do we really pursue it? Or do you let the enemy come in and say, you're not really that good at that. There's people that are so much better at that than you are. Who, who do you think you are? Is, do we let the enemy diffuse a situation and deceive us, trick us? In Matthew 25, 24, it says, we're talking about the man who had received the one talent. Remember, there was ten, there was five, and there's one. Now, you can call this money. You can call this talent. You can call it a gift. You can call it anything you want because it stands for all of those things. And then he, which had received the one talent, came before the master and said, I know thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid the talent in the earth. There thou hast that is thine. His master and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant. I'm not saying that today. Yahweh is saying that today. Thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and I gather where I have not strewn. I'm not saying today that we are wicked. I know this is a hard statement here. But every one of us have something. Paul said to Corinth, who had multiple gifts. There was all kinds of gifts manifesting the assembly in chapter 12. It wasn't a problem. There were gifts all over the place. Everybody, he said everybody has a, a song or a psalm or a, a word of knowledge or a gift or a, everybody has something, you know. And so why has it changed today? We all have something we can do in the assembly to edify one another and to lift up and encourage and to heal. But I see very few people, maybe you see more than I do, I see very few people coming forward with personal gifts. But you know, this is a two-way street. Beverly and I travel all over the country. We, we visit almost every assembly that there is to visit out there, basically in the names. The leadership also has to let the brethren come forward. If the leadership says no, it has to come from the anointed elders only. That's quenching the spirit. Paul said, don't quench the spirit. Yahweh said, don't quench the spirit. Timothy said, you always do quench the spirit of Yahweh. You always do resist the spirit of Yahweh, Stephen said before he was killed. The leadership has to let that come forward. The leadership has to be like a father, it has to be like Yahshua, who is the best father, the best encourager, the best teacher, the best mentor, the best example. Isn't he our example? Don't we want to be everything that Yahshua is? Because Yahweh had said unto him, this is my beloved son who I am well pleased. And Yahshua encourages us today that to seek those gifts, let them manifest. If the assembly where you're at says, well, no, we just don't really allow that, then, then go to them. Give them a, write a little teaching paper. Give it to the elders. Talk to the elders. Encourage the elders to help them understand. They're only men. Yes, they're called. Yes, they're anointed. Yes, they're in a position of authority. And yes, they're worthy of double honor if they do the job well. But the brethren have a voice, if it's scriptural, if it's done decently in order before all things. Next point. 
some will not put forth efforts to go to the feast. You know, in this last year, we have said this many times on film, that Yahweh has given us a revelation that it used to be in assemblies years and years ago that they say, save up your money that second tithe and just go to the Feast of Tabernacles. This is the command and gathering. Go where Yahweh places his name. But it says in Exodus, it says, go where Yahweh place your name three times. And there are people for unleavened bread and Passover who stay home. Now, it's not unlawful to have Passover at home. We don't have to go to the temple. We don't have a temple. We don't have to go to the assembly. That's not what I'm saying. But go for the appointed feast times. We're supposed to leave our house and go where Yahshua places his name. It is a commandment. It says go three times a year. Your males will go three times a year. We came out of Egypt, didn't we? On the 15th, we came out of Egypt. We came. We were going and we went where Yahweh placed his name. He said, I brought you with eagle's wings unto myself that I might give you my commandments, my statutes, my judgments. People are staying home for unleavened bread. Just kind of keeping the high days somehow without fellowship. And I suggest to you strongly again, please, this isn't what Yahweh intends. There are some that some years they don't go to tabernacles. You know that tabernacles represents the wedding feast? If you don't want to go to the wedding feast that is here, that's a dress rehearsal, that is practice and fellowship and a commanded moed, we may not be invited to the real wedding feast with Yahshua, where he said, I will gird, you, gird myself and serve you. We don't want to miss that. Please reconsider if you are not fully committed to attend the feast, to, to reread the scriptures and pray about that. What should we be looking for at this time? Let's go into the next, next major category. What should we be looking for at this time? I've got a list of about 10 things here. We should be looking, being awake, alive. We should be sober, vigilant. <coughs> because first, we are supposed to keep our garments clean and unspotted. Kodesh. Yahweh said, I am Kodesh, be ye Kodesh, be holy before me. And some... Some's walk, some people, individuals walk, is loose. Defiling the Sabbath, buying and selling, doing all kinds of things. The second point is, keeping our relation, this is probably number one, but I had it number two. Keeping our relationship close to Yahweh. I would ask us today to evaluate ourselves and say today, today on this set-apart day, this Sabbath, how is my relationship with Yahweh and Yahshua? Is it close? Is it intimate? Am I seeking Him? I know that there are periods of time where Yahweh and Yahshua seem to be quiet. We don't, at times, seem to have a lot of feedback. But that doesn't mean we can't be seeking, that we can't be motivated and zealous to raise up Kodesh hands, worship, to seek him, to pray, to pour out tears. All of us have tears about something. How is your relationship today with Yahweh and Yeshua? The next point is, are we growing in knowledge and grace and understanding? Do we feel this last week, this last month, this last year or since the feast that we're still growing in knowledge and grace and understanding and discernment you know Paul described in Hebrews chapter 5 and 6 Paul described what a mature mature believer was those who exercise their senses to discern good from evil and there's people today in the assemblies believers that have been in the word in the in the in the baptism, in the names, in, in, in the grace, in the calling for 10 or 20 or 30 years who can't discern between good and evil. They can't. Some situation comes up which is clearly evil. 
It's a disfellowshipping situation. If there's two or three witnesses, we take proper action, and they say, well, maybe we should just pray about it. Back off on this whole thing. Just pray about it. Let Yahweh handle it. Give it over to Yahweh. That seems to be a very slick and clever and appropriate thing to say, but it isn't appropriate when there's some open sin in the assembly. It isn't appropriate. Paul said, Yahweh said, you judge within the assembly. I will judge outside. You judge within the assembly. If you ju can't judge the smallest of things, how shall the saints come and judge the world? For Enoch prophesied he comes with ten thousands of his saints. We're going to judge the world. And we're having trouble judging inappropriate, lax, commandment breaking within the assembly. There's even witchcraft in some assemblies going on. Witchcraft, the punishment for witchcraft is death. The next point is we should be watching for deception. We should be on guard. Satan goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Today, probably the average believer has somewhere between three and five publications from different ministries coming in the front door. If you pick up, and they read everything, we seem to read everything, if you pick up a document and it says that Yahshua didn't pre-exist and we're going to prove it, or Yahshua wasn't born of a virgin, or something absurd, crazy, and blasphemous like that, that has to do with core salvation beliefs, why even read that paper? Why even read it? You know it's from the enemy, you know it's not true. We've, we've settled those issues. We're opening ourselves up to deception. We need to be wise when it comes to deception. We need to have to pray. We have to pray for discernment. If we're half asleep, we may just pick up anything in the evening. I'm talking about spiritually asleep, and pick up anything in the day or the evening and just read it, just because we feel like we're reading something biblical when it may not be biblical at all. But we'll make that mistake if we're asleep. Next point is, are we growing in fervent love toward the brethren? Paul said that your love toward one another, Yahweh said, that your love toward one another would abound even more. You realize that it says because their love wax cold, that their love wax cold, for one another, that that's part of the falling away. You realize that the, the whole six second part of the commandments, the second stone with the six commandments on it has to do with loving our brother. Mm -hmm. And if those six go by the wayside, if that love for others grow cold, Yahweh can't use us. As we said earlier today, Yahweh is in the people business. He's in the mercy business. He's in the restoration business. <coughs> As a friend of mine says in Michigan, he's in, the, he's in the salvage business. Because a lot of us were wrecks when Yahshua picked us up. If the love of the brethren for the brethren waxes cold, and we allow that happen because we're, we're numb and we're half asleep, we may not find ourselves in this calling. In 2 Thessalonians, you don't have to go there, most of you know this, in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, it says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there will be a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, that son of perdition, a falling away. We can lose our love in relationship with Yahweh and Yeshua. We can lose our love for our fellow brethren in the assemblies. Those who are being called. Even those who are not being called, they're still made in Yahweh's image. And he's got a plan for every one of them. So we seek peace with every man. But we have the witness and the testimony. We are the end time people. We are the end time remnant. He said that Satan turned to make war with in Revelations. Who keep the commandments of Almighty Yahweh. And have the testimony of Yahshua Messiah. We are that remnant. And we have a job to do. That's what we're talking about here. That's what Yahweh is saying. It isn't just a, a walk that is, that is passive. 
a walk that is Laodicean. It's the fact that we, maybe we're not doing the work. You can't work when you're sleeping. You can't work when you're half asleep. Not with any proficiency. Are you watching? The next point is, are you watching the prophecies of Jerusalem? Because all major prophecy, all moeds, all knowledge, all law comes out of Zion. Jerusalem is the heart of the earth. It's the navel of the earth. It's the apple of his eye. It's his Kodesh city. It has his name. His name is in that city. And all prophecy with the end times are going to deal with the Middle East and Jerusalem. Not what the, pre what, not what the president is doing in Washington or that are going to raise our taxes, or the BATF <clears throat> and Home Security Act is going to take away our rights and liberties. That has nothing to do with it. It's a small indicator we're getting toward the end time, but the real prophecy comes out of Jerusalem. And with his Kodesh people, the ones who will come in last, the ones that he loved, the tribe that he came out of, Yehuda, all major prophecy is going to happen there with them, even though they're called last. They will come in last because they were called first. They were given it first. Peter and John and Paul both said to Yehuda, it was right and meet that we came and preached the good news unto you first, but because you count yourselves unworthy, we turn to the Gentiles. Now the last shall be first and the first shall be last. But all major prophecy goes on there. Are we staying active and victorious and zealous and putting on the whole armor of Yahweh to fight against the wiles of the enemy, the very, very prince of the air that rules this world. Yeshua doesn't rule this world. He works in everyone's lives. He is sovereign over all, including the enemy, of course. But there's one that rules this world and runs this world. If you don't believe it, walk out to your front yard and see what the world is doing. They're not following Yahweh. They're following someone else. You can, either, you can only, you only have two masters in this world. There's only two masters that you can follow. You're either serving Yahweh or you're serving Satan. Are we passive in this fight that Paul and Timothy and others talk about fighting the good fight of faith? Are we passive in this fight and this resistance? It says, draw nigh unto Yahweh and resist Satan, he shall flee from you. Are we passive in this fight? Because when we go to assemblies, we see people oppressed deceived and beat up, emotionally, physically sick, all kinds of terrible things going on. They try to get all dressed up. We get all dressed up and put on a happy face for Sabbath and sit there and listen to the message. But when at the fellowship meal, you find out about all the trouble and the disappointments and the pain and the darkness. All of us are under attack. That is, this is, that's the way of this world. We live in the enemy's camp, and we're being buffeted on every side. Satan works, as we've said many times, he works 24-7 on us. Just because we don't see what he's doing doesn't mean he isn't doing something. He comes to lie, steal, kill, and destroy. And his first target, the red list, you know, the believers that are called out. Because that's a big prize unto him. To get somebody to fall away, to get somebody discouraged and cast down and turn away from the truth and the center of all life, which is Yahshua. He's the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end. He is everything. The Alpha and the Tav, he's everything. <clears throat> Joel 3, 9 through 11. Joel 3, 9 through 11. <clears throat> We are in a war to hold on to this faith and to grow and to do the things that are commanded and led by the Spirit of Yahweh. We are in a war. There is an adversary to hold us back. He's trying to hold us back. He's trying to destroy our faith, but he's also trying to hold us back from doing the work. I heard uh, like a couple of years ago that in Revelation 14, there are three angels that come across proclaiming the end time messages of the two witnesses. Fear Yahweh and give him the worship and the honor and the esteem. Come out of Babylon and take not the mark of the beast. Revelation 14. And I was told, well, that's just going to be three angels. That's three angels. It says three angels. <coughs> we'll be hiding somewhere in the end times. That'll be angels flying across with a big trumpet and a loudspeaker. I was actually told this by a pastor's wife. 
Yahweh has never used angelic hosts to preach the evangel. Never. He's always used men. We are his instruments, his weapons and battle axe. Isaiah 51.20. We are his instruments of the message, the evangel. He says, what I speak to you in private, you will yell from the housetops. Joel 3, 9, proclaim ye this among the Gentiles, <clears throat> prepare war, wake up the mighty men, let all the men of war draw near, let them come up, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears, let the weak say, I am strong, assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen, and gather yourselves together round about, thither cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Yahweh. It's a time of war. Satan already knows that he has a short time. He reads the scriptures. It says in Ephesians 6, put on the whole armor of Yahweh, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, gird with truth, shod with the preparation of the good news, taking the shield of faith to quench all the fiery darts in this, and the sword of the word that you may be able to stand in that evil day. What is the evil day? It's the day when your faith is on shaky ground. It's the day when your eyelids are half closed. It's the day that you are passive, that you are vulnerable and about to face temptation that you may not overcome. That's the evil day. It's not the end times. And we may have more than one evil day. That's why we put that armor on and we don't take it off. We hear people say, and my wife reminded me three or four years ago, I said, well, I just put on, I'm praying, I put on the whole armor of Yahweh right now, Yahshua, help me. I put on all the helmet, and, and she said, why'd you take it off? The next point we have is fervent in prayer and fasting. When was the last time you fasted? I'm not talking about a juice fast. I'm not talking about a fruit fast. I'm not talking about a nut fast. I'm not talking about a vitamin fast. I'm talking about water only. More than one day. When was the last time we fasted? Do you only fast on the Day of Atonement? Yeshua told John's disciples, he said, when the master is taken away, when the bridegroom is taken away, my servants will fast. Does this sound today like a full-time job? Does it sound like a full-time calling? It is. It's a full-time calling. I'm going to skip part of this. The next, next point I have is mediocrity. I'm not going to go through all this. But I have kind of a, a paper. I'll just give you the, give you the places where this is written. <coughs> the first step, there's six steps to mediocrity. That's what we're talking about, coasting. Always overreact. It cites 1 Kings 19, verse 10. Elijah says, after he killed all the prophets of Baal, he runs out and he hides in the cave. Remember that? And he says, and Yahweh says, what are, you, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? And he says, I'm zealous for Yahweh. I've done all these things and now they seek to take my life and I'm the last one to live. I'm the last believer. I'm the last person. He overreacts. Overreaction is the first step to mediocrity, not understanding the big picture. We talked about that earlier, about the big picture. Number two, never look for the whole understanding. Never look for the whole understanding. In John 5, 8 and 9, one day on the Sabbath day, a man came to him who was, uh, I think was sick with the palsy. He was laying on his mat and he said, get up and walk. And the man was healed. 
And the Pharisees said, You've broken the Sabbath. You have done that which is not lawful. And of course, you know what Yeshua said. Isn't a sheep better than a man? Won't you help a sheep out of the ditch on the Sabbath day? Isn't a man much more valuable than a sheep? They didn't understand the big picture. He said, he said, mercy and judgment are the weightier matters of the law. They just wanted to keep the letter of the law, which he said the letter of the law kills. So they lacked, they didn't see the big picture here again. They didn't see that, that mercy and, and, and compassion and healing and encouragement was just as important as any other matter of the law. Number three. Never accept construct, constructive feedback. Never take advice. Never take counsel. Genesis 4, 5 through 7. One day in the field, it was an appropriate time, I think it was Passover, but maybe it wasn't. Cain and Abel both brought offerings unto Yahweh in Genesis 4, 5 and 7 and 15. Yahweh had respect unto Abel's offering, didn't he? He offered a lamb, the best of his best of his best, without spot, without wrinkle. Cain brought fruits and vegetables and things because he was a farmer, but we believe that what he brought was not the best. It was second best. And Yahweh had no respect for Cain's offering. And Cain was wroth with Abel about this. And they strove over this. And Abel said to him, you know, if you do good, won't you be blessed? <laughs> but if you don't do well, sin lieth at the door. Abel gave advice. We never talk about this. Abel gave advice unto Cain. He tried to help his brother. However, Cain wouldn't take the counsel, would he? Step three of mediocrity. Number four, always look for number one. Always look out for number one. This violates all the commandments. <laughs> this violates all the scripture that Yahweh and counsel that Yahweh gives us. In 2 Kings 5, 20 through 21 and 26 through 27, remember Gehazi and Elijah? Gehazi was the servant of Naaman, that had the leprosy that was going to Elijah for healing. Remember that? It was Elijah's servant. He was Elijah's servant. Yeah. 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 Now, Naaman wanted to give gifts unto Elijah. And he wouldn't receive them. Didn't want them. Didn't even talk to him, actually. Never even saw him. Never came out of his house. That's what he was mad about. Gehazi sees an opportunity to excel here and he runs out after Naaman's leaving and, and, the, and he still had all these gifts he, that he didn't give to Elijah. And he tells him that he'll take some of them. He goes after them himself. Okay. Elisha finds out and he curses him and he said, let the leprosy be on you and all your, your generations henceforth. Because in this case, Gehazi was looking for opportunity to bless himself, to do something that was unlawful, to actually <coughs> lie and steal. He was looking out for number one. That's a point number four in mediocrity, of being asleep, of, of not being aware of what you're doing, realizing that you're going into sin and covetousness. Number five, don't take responsibility for your own actions. Genesis 3.12 and, and uh, folks, I'm not, I'm not picking on the women. But <clears throat> after Eve was deceived, and she was in, she was deceived, and she took the fruit, whatever it was, and gave it to her husband. And, and Yahweh, Yahshua, showed up and said, Woman, what have you done? She, said, she didn't say, Well, I messed up. It's all my fault. I was wrong. You told me, and it's all my fault, and I take full responsibility. She said, No. She said, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. What did, what did Adam say? 
Adam said, the woman you gave me <laughs> gave me the fruit. Number five, not taking responsibility for your own actions. Number six, never be genuine, never be real. We have Matthew 16, 16 and Luke 22, 33. Yeshua was ready to go to Jerusalem. It was late in the chapter, late in his ministry, and he's ready to go to Jerusalem. And Peter said to him, Let it be far from you, Master. That should never happen, that he should go to Jerusalem. He's talking to Yeshua. And besides other things, Peter said unto him, Sovereign, Yahweh, Master, I am ready to go with you both to prison or to death. And of course, Yeshua turned around and he told him, before the night's over, you'll deny me three times. Maybe Peter was aware of his unbelief. Maybe he wasn't. Maybe just at the moment that he felt very, very committed, very zealous and willing to sacrifice his life for Yahshua or instead of Yahshua or go with him. But he should have realized and stopped and thought with understanding what he was saying, the type of death that he would end, persecution he was about to face with Yahshua. At any rate, he was not consistent in his walk, was he? Because later that evening he denied him, not just once, maybe we could, maybe we could understand once, he was nervous, he was afraid, but three times, Yahshua said to him, even before that night, I believe, he said, when you're converted, see, Peter was not converted in, the ministry, in that ministry with Yahshua. He said, when you're converted, go strengthen your brethren. Some of us are not converted in the assemblies. We haven't really come in, not, not really changed our heart and changed our minds and, and turned, turned. That's what conversion and repentance is, turning. And there's no condemnation there. It's just Yahweh saying, it's high time. It's high time to do that. The time is short. I've given you enough time for most of you. In conclusion, today I've got a couple of scriptures. Revelation 3.3. 3. Revelation 3.3. 3. Remember therefore how Thou hast received what thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I come unto thee. Luke 12, 37. Luke 12, 37. Yeshua says, watch. Be sober, be vigilant, be zealous. In Luke 12, 37 it says, Blessed are those servants whom the Master when he cometh shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. This is the wedding supper. We want everyone that is called to make it. We want everyone to be, uh, he wants to, everyone to be zealously affected. We want everyone to be willing to be, to be ostracized because it says in uh, Philippians 1.29, we're not only called to believe in him, but to suffer for his sake. There is suffering. Yahweh has made it clear to us in the scriptures that if we are in this calling, that we are going to be rejected, we are going to be hated, we're going to be face scorn and ridicule and mockings, and maybe even cruel beatings. We might even spend a day and night in the deep. Yahweh has sent his only begotten son to pay a price that we could not pay, and he was hated, scorned, beaten, spit on. And then it got worse, they killed him. We have to walk through some of those footsteps. We have to drink some of that cup. That's what this walk is about. 
to walk in his footsteps and finish the work that he set before us. And suffering and rejection and hardship is part of this. It even says in the scripture, endure hardship. It isn't just because you only took one pair of sandals. It's because we are hated in this world. But we are to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And be awake, proactive, be zealous for the work in the name of Yahshua HaMashiach. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The name of the song I'm going to sing is just the mention of your name. Yeah.
Praise Yahweh. We thank you for being with us today. We pray for you. Please pray for us. Seek Yahweh with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, all your strength. For that is the Shema. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh or Elohim is one. Thou shalt love Yahweh with all thy heart, thy soul, thy strength. Yahweh is one. Yahweh be with you and strengthen you. If you have any questions or comments, please call us here or email us. At the Assembly of Yah, our new email is askyah, six letters, uh, A-S-K-Y-A-H, at ivnet, ivnet.com. Yahweh be with you. We'll see you next Sabbath. Hallelujah.